I'm going to dedicate this talk to my grandchildren. And the, the guy that's sitting in the magnet there, the little baby, that's the father of my four grandchildren. <laughs> so that's, that was a magnet that Ohio State University purchased for me when I became an assistant professor. It cost the university almost a million dollars. I, I think by the time they housed it and everything, it was well over a million dollars to buy this for me uh, as a young assistant professor. So today I want to thank the university for that. That was an enormous startup package for someone who was only 28. Uh, and I said this at a, at a previous conference of Ben's, and I, I hope people keep it in mind and relate it to their children, you know. I, these, these were words that I said, the change brings hope that our children to our children that they too can contribute to the advancement of science. And that's really what this is all about, right? We're not always going to be here, but we hope to give something that our kids can build on. And uh, science really does belong to them, and that's why we're doing it. And uh, this one gets me in trouble. Uh, science will change when actually the population says, we don't believe you guys anymore. <laughs> so. <laughs> Some people get really upset about that because they say, well, what, what? <laughs> so, so, so some scientists, they get upset about that because they, they think that science is just about them and their laboratories and what they do. But actually, they're all subject to what the population thinks. And, you know, nowadays, uh, with communication and stuff, there's a lot of intelligent people out there, and all scientists are accountable to to the planet. I mean, we're not we're not islands in ivory towers, and we're not people in ivory towers. We we are accountable to the population, and uh, we always have to keep that in mind. Uh, so I'm going to start my talk uh, with the birth of ultra high field magnetic resonance. Uh, I think there's four parts to my talk, and this is the first part. And uh, Ben was very generous in describing my contributions to magnetic resonance. Of course, magnetic resonance was uh, much preceded me. Uh, and I know, I, I got the privilege to know all its founders, some of them well. And, uh, but what I, my contribution to it was ultra high field magnetic resonance. And uh, so when I was a young assistant professor, they were building the world's first four Tesla magnets. So most clinical magnets are at one and a half Tesla. And uh, one Tesla is 10,000 Gauss, and the Earth's magnetic field is about half a Gauss. So uh, when you go to a clinical site, if you need an MRI, you're usually at about one and a half Tesla. And uh, when I was a young professor, they were building the first four Tesla magnet. And I actually turned down that project to go to Ohio State, and people really wondered, oh, how could he turn down the first, being working on the first four Tesla project to go to Ohio State? And that's a little bit of a long story, but I did. And, and back in the day, there were four or five four Tesla magnets, and that really wasn't going uh, well for science. And there was kind of a conception in, in magnetic resonance that all high fields, four Tesla or above, was really the domain of the very bright or, you know, the, the very powerful laboratories. And then I came along at Ohio State and I built an AT, and I think that that kind of changed the mentality in magnetic resonance imaging that people started believing that they too can do it. <laughs> and so now we have uh, over 70, uh, seven Tesla and above magnets in the world. Uh, now the price of these things is over, uh, the running cost is usually about a million dollars per Tesla, so you can see that that's, that's starting to be some fraction of a billion dollars, especially you have to house these things and you need personnel. So, uh, so in 1988, I built the world's first eight Tesla, and then uh, now the current world record is 10 and a half Tesla at the University of Minnesota. And I think there's uh, two or three 9.4 Teslas. So most of them are seven Teslas, and then uh, a few 9.4s, and now a 10.5 Tesla at the University of Minnesota. And of course, I didn't do this alone. And uh, there's many stories here of people I, I can thank and that God brought into my life, some of them uh, very special that I haven't seen for a long time. But uh, this was uh, the people that were uh, part of my division or closely associated with them. Some were in other departments, but they were very closely associated 
uh, with our group when we did the AT. And of course, we had industrial partners, and uh, David Rayner was the president of Magnet Scientific. That was a company in, in England, and uh, he agreed to build this monster magnet for us, which at the time he had only built a three Tesla magnet. And uh, he was a little intimidated to build an eight Tesla magnet because he thought, oh my gosh, what if we fail? We won't get paid. You know, we're just a little company. We can't afford the, the risk. So I proposed to him, I said, well, look, Dave, I mean, uh, instead of building me an eight, why don't we contract for a six? And every tenth of a Tesla from six to eight Tesla will give you more money. And that way you can absorb some of your risk. Previously, people would, you'd have to reach field. And if you don't, you don't get paid. Now, you should know that uh, one of the four Tesla systems in the world was at the University of Illinois, and Paul Lauterbur, who won the Nobel Prize for Magnetic Resonance, wanted that system, and they spent probably $10 million on that instrument, and it never came to field. So, uh, you know, when you look at very high field magnets, these are complicated things, and uh, people took risks and some of them had considerable suffering in their personal life as they pushed science forward. So you always have to remember that about scientists, that uh, sometimes uh, life is beautiful, but there's some suffering as well. Uh, so we, other people, we, for our gradient amplifiers, that was the magnet. For the gradient amplifiers, we had Crown International, a major gradient amplifier supplier, uh, resident research, and Hewlett Packard did our shim power supplies. The RF shield, we'll talk about that in detail. Uh, that was done by Lindgren RF enclosures. And the Michael Link at Ohio Steel and Sheet Plate built the, built, the, uh, built the iron shield around the magnet. And Michael was quite the guy. I mean, he, he was a guy that was kind of the Green Beret type of, in life. You need to meet a few of these people in your life. So uh, then the consoles were from Brooker. Paul Noah gave us a system. The RF amplifiers, uh, we negotiated those with CPC. They were the first such amplifiers to be able to hit 340 megahertz, which, uh, and then the TR switches were heel engineering. So a little bit about the magnet. It, it had a, just a phenomenal uh, homogeneity. You don't really need to worry about these numbers. The one thing I wanted to talk about was the amount of stored energy in it. That's the third line down. It, it had 81 megajoules of stored energy, OK? So that's like if you take a 200-ton locomotive in kinetic energy now, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend like we're going to convert this all to kinetic energy. That's like taking a 200-ton locomotive and sending it down the tracks at 60 miles an hour. That's how much energy that locomotive would have. So this magnet has that much stored magnetic energy in it. So at the time it was built, it had the most stored magnetic energy in the world. And... Uh, it had 21,000 pounds of force on its inner windings. Oh, another thing about stored energy, if you guys are old enough, you might remember those commercials, you know, you hear a pin drop. I think it was Sprint, that if you hear the little pin drop, well, that's one millijoule. Now, these magnets can be quenched with a one millijoule disturbance. So just think, that's like taking a, a train and derailing it by throwing a little pin to it. So that's how sensitive they are to any disturbance in the field. And it was made from 414 kilometers of niobium titanium wire. It weighed, it weighed 77,000 pounds, and it operated at 4 Kelvin. It contained 1,600 liters of helium, and it was surrounded by a 200-ton iron shield. Now, these numbers have all been dwarfed now by the 10.5T at the University of Minnesota. So this is uh, a... The, a cut section of the magnet, and you can see the five, the four major formers of the magnet. Those are where the windings come. When they had to get a winding machine in Portugal to build this magnet, the magnet company didn't have a winding machine that was big enough to do this job. And so here's the guy. He's actually winding the inner coil right here. The outer coil, this is the outermost former. And right here, where my, he's putting some of the windings on the winding machine. And then here's the magnet. This is me when I was not bald yet, uh, on top of the <laughs> magnet here. And David Rayner, who actually became a, a very good friend, the president of the company at the time. And this is the outer former of the AT, and you see the, the windings here of the magnet on the outer former. So the outer former has less windings. There's much, much more windings on the inner formers. So there are the four formers. 
And then here's the magnet as it arrived at Ohio State. I mean, that was just... Now, believe it or not, how blessed can you be in life? This magnet arrived at Ohio State on Christmas Eve. <laughs> All right? So this is important because we're going to talk at the end of the talk about the Haruini antenna. And what, I, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the, the plates, the iron plates, actually being assembled. And there's a guy over here welding, and that's why the picture looks the way it is. He's actually, the arc is actually going off. And he's welding all the seams. And that's because we don't want any RF to leak into the magnet room. Okay? So all of this will be a completely sealed room. So all the joints of the iron are welded, and then the room is then enclosed in copper. You can see here, this is the door that goes into the magnet room. This is the bottom of the door, and you can see there's, there's a copper plate here, and then there's, there's penetration panels that are filled with filters to bring stuff below the magnet into the magnet room. And then the other one here, this is the top of a door, so you can see this is all copper, and this is all... Uh, secure. Whoops. So this is important because we don't want any RF leaking. Okay, so we're 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 sending out watts of power, and we're 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 just detecting microvolts. So any leak, uh, it's amazing, and that's something that the astronomers need to pay attention to, that it doesn't take very much for a big leak to enter into a room, and uh, we have requirements for the AT. And I think it, it was like 40 dB attenuation of a signal that's outside the magnet and inside the magnet room. Oh, and there's something interesting about that is if you have a 9.4 Tesla magnet, okay, why is this important? Well, if you have a 9.4 Tesla magnet, the carbon resonance is sitting at 100 megahertz. So that's right where your radio station is, 100 megahertz on the FM dial. Uh, so that's why we don't want to hear 100 megahertz when we're doing our work. So that's why this is all in a shielded room. So here's the magnet. It's, uh, it's sitting in its, in, its, uh, in its shielded room. And I had uh, felt that it was very important to put this in a clinical setting. And so this is, was actually linked to the hospital. Uh, and this is me again with a little more hair. And th these are, these are the, the cryo uh, pumps. That, that are they're pumping on the helium to keep it in liquefied states. And uh, there was a guy that was named earlier in the talk, Wayne Chung. He was a part of the Department of Industrial Des of uh, Industrial Design at OSU, and he designed. I told him I said, well, I don't want this to look for the patient like he's walking into my science project. So. <laughs> So Wayne spent a lot of time designing the colors of this gantry and how the magnet would look to the patient. And then uh, Dr. Jagadish and Dr. Bailey. Jagadish was actually in pharmacy, but he was very good with uh, computers. And uh, Dr. Bailey is an older gentleman, which I've talked about in previous talks, and he helped, they helped build the table, design the table, and so on. So there was a lot of collaboration from for many people at OSU, and I, and I was really blessed to become friends with a lot of these people. And uh, this was a, a crazy idea I had. Well, it wasn't so crazy, actually, because it ended up being key to the ultra-high field. But in 1994, I proposed the idea that uh, to build a torque-compensated uh, asymmetric gradient coil for echo planar. And uh, I had a really talented guy in my lab, Amir Abdul-Jalil, probably I, I would say I owe so much in my life to him, and uh, he, I came up with the crazy idea, and he was very good at computers, and he spent probably months com computing to balance this torque and come up with the design. So, you know, so scientists can come up with an idea, but uh, there's some engineers or people that are very talented that, that make that come to fruition. So. It's still important to come up with the idea. I don't minimize it, but uh, others are always involved. And this was the RF coil that we used, so it looks a little strange maybe to you, but your head would have to go into this. And my, my head was actually the first one to be imaged at ultra-high field in the world. And uh, at the time, uh, there were some concerns, and I'll talk about that later in my talk. But if you, if you, seal, if you seal this coil at both ends, 
you get a resonant cavity with very elevated cues. So you could you could actually seal this. It's open, and I and I could seal this, and then it, it becomes completely enclosed, and I could put a sample in it, and the cues go up, and the power just drops. So in microwave, it is well known that sealed metallic cavities are resonant and not black. And this is, you can see now that I'm moving slowly towards Kirchhoff's law and black body radiation. So MRI would not exist if we didn't have resonant coils. And uh, so this is something Kirchhoff could have never known. That, uh, and we'll talk about that a little later in the talk. So this, uh, after I got the first images, you know, it's amazing. Uh, you get letters to the editor against you. Uh, and, and people complained because they, one of them complained that the first image I wrote that uh, this is very clinically promising and somebody, somebody wrote that, uh, well, you know, that's premature. And, and I, I, I said, no, it's not. I mean, it's, these, these images are great. And, and then I, I wrote this, which I actually wanted to read to you guys. It's, people really believe that you would never get an image at ultra high field, okay, that it was an impossibility. And that was uh, prevalent throughout the entire community. And uh, a lot of people thought, you know, he's just crazy, he's gonna go to a Tesla, and six Tesla is the next step. And I said, well, you know, if I build an eight, somewhere between eight and four Tesla, there's a field that works and I can reach all of them. So just because you have a Ferrari doesn't mean you have to go 200. So that's what I tried to explain to them, that we could build an eight Tesla, and uh, if, it, if the field was too high, we could always lower it. But that never ended up being a problem. So somebody wrote against me, and I wrote this answer. For instance, less than one year ago, there were real questions as to whether or not a whole body eight Tesla magnet could be constructed. In addition, RF coil technology was thought by many to present an insurmountable hurdle. More importantly, it was thought that RF power requirements would be much too high at ultra-high fields, that RF penetration would render imaging impossible, and that dielectric resonances would destroy image quality. And actually, I got to know Paul Lauterberg, who won the Nobel Prize for Magnetic Resonance, and in my book on ultra-high field MRI, Paul writes the foreword, and he actually writes in there that uh, people had said, and even written, that this could not be done. Now, he just uses the word people. Now, Paul is deceased, and I know he won't mind because he was somewhat close to me, I think. And, uh, I mean, he was happy that I went to Ultra High Field. And, of course, he was the one that had written. <laughs> <laughs> so, he was a very, very uh, good scientist. And, uh, anyhow, that's just a side note. So, people had said we'd never get these images. So, the, the two here on the left... Uh, of the screen. These are one and a half T images in gradient echo is the name of the sequence. You don't need to worry about what kind of sequence we're doing. But uh, so the two on the left are, are one and a half T. The two in the center were actually world records. That was a 4.7 Tesla image. So the previous world record was four Tesla. And I had decided, well, look, I won't go to eight Tesla first because if I have trouble, then they'll say, well, he never even got an image of four Tesla. Now he thinks he's going to do eight. So what I did was I got the magnet company to bring the magnet up to eight Tesla. And then after it got to field and we knew it was good, I, I told them, okay, now bring it down to 4.7. So then we had a new, we had a, position where we could get a new world record at 4.7 and we got these images at, at 4.7 Tesla almost immediately. And then, uh, then of course, these are some of the first eight Tesla images. So the first thing you'll notice is that we could see the center of the head. And people had said before that you wouldn't be able to see the center of the head. That was an RF penetration problem. Or that there were fundamental dielectric resonances that would enable you, that you would never see the center of the head. You'd have, you'd have dark spots, dark shadows uh, with, you know, with interference in the head uh, because the head was, they thought, would act as a resonator. And, and it doesn't. The head has a very low Q, so we got some images. So then we, we get into this this area where I, which I've become very disliked for, uh, about thermal properties. And, and there are actually five thermal properties in magnetic resonance. The first is T1 relaxation, 
You don't have to learn about that today, <laughs> but there, it's, it's there for people who know magnetic resonance and see the lecture, they'll know what T1 relaxation is. RF penetration is another thermal property. Uh, signal is thermal, noise power, and RF power deposition. And we'll go through these uh, one at a time. So T1 relaxation, Felix Bloch, who won the Nobel Prize for magnetic resonance, uh, referred to the T1 relaxation as the thermal relaxation constant. So he brought in the word thermal into, the, into magnetic resonance, into NMR, which is our sister technique, uh, in 1945. So there's no question that NMR is a thermal technique. And if you disagree, uh, maybe you could write letters to the editor against Felix's papers, even though he's deceased today. Uh, then the second is RF penetration. Be before the eight tests was assembled, there was a fear that MRI, in the MRI community, that the RF pulse would be unable to excite spins at the center of the head. The RF pulse was thought to be unable to pre penetrate that deeply. And of course, I showed you that it did penetrate, and any attenuation of the RF pulse as it penetrates a system must involve lattice interaction and is therefore thermal in nature. And this is a, I love this image. And I've shown it a few times, and I don't know if I've shown it at one of Ben's meetings. This was an image that we, had, we were getting so many images, and, and this was an image that kind of had been lost on my computer. I didn't really pay attention to it. And then one day I brought it up, and I looked at it, and I decided to blow it up. And when I did, lo and behold, I was just stunned. And, and the reason is, is that for the first time ever in the human brain, we were seeing these small vessels crossing the gray matter. So, so, here, so here's the gray matter of your brain right here. And you're seeing these small, small vessels crossing the gray matter that had never, ever been seen before. And the other thing that you're finding is that, so let, let's say from here to here, this is the gray matter. And you'll see that some of the gray matter is darker on the image and some of the gray matter is wider on the image. So we're actually seeing differentiation within the gray matter. That was just a shock. So when this was published in, uh, uh, in JCAT, it, uh, the editor of JCAT, Alan Elster, wrote just a beautiful introduction about how phenomenal these images were. Uh, so that goes back to RF penetration. It's also related to signal. We had great signal to noise. Initially, I had reported that the signal to noise was low, but we soon corrected it uh, before anyone. Uh, so the first, the first three years, from 98 through 2000, uh, we published 20 papers at 8 Tesla. That's before the first seven Tesla came online. And so we had done quite a bit of work already and had shown that the signal was in fact high at ultra high field. So a signal in MRI is governed in large part by the Boltzmann equation, which is temperature dependent. You see this is the, you don't need to worry about the equation. You just see the little T here in the equation and you see, well, that stands for temperature. So this equation is temperature dependent, that's it. Now noise power, so that was signal. Noise power is also a thermal process and the phenomenon is quite complex. And beyond the electronics acquire, associated with signal acquisition, now that's where we, we should have the noise figure of the preamp. Uh, Noise power originates from all the lattices that make up the human tissue, including those associated with water, cell membranes, proteins, etc. So this is the classic equation, the quantum mechanical treatment of a graphite resistor. And for those who know quantum mechanics and who studied uh, black body radiation, you'll immediately recognize that this has some terms that look like Planck's body, uh, black body radiation formula in it. But in magnetic resonance, uh, we People use this approximation because they consider that they're in the genes Raleigh region, and so they simplify this. But of course, the human body is not a graphite resistor. So putting this all together, signal to noise, I mean, here, this image looks pretty bad, right? But it's actually the best that a one and a half Tesla scanner can do. So what I've done here is I pushed the image push the scanner right to the limit. The matrix is a 512 by 512. The field of view was 20 centimeters. It was a two millimeter slice. The mutation angle was uh, 45. And so we're, we're pushing the scanner as hard as we can with a high resolution, a thin slice, and you can see that it doesn't look very good. Now, pay attention that this was a 512 by 512, 
and now this is a 2K by 2K at a Tesla, and it's similar parameters. Again, the slice is two millimeters, the nutation is 45. So this just blew the one and a half Tesla out of the water. The enormous amount of signal to noise. And I, th I still think, now is, this has been uh, 19 years or 20 years ago this year that this was acquired. And uh, I still think it's the world record for resolution in MRI. Now, for all of us who are old like me, you remember the Y2K crisis, right? Everybody thought uh, <laughs> every, everything was going to collapse for Y2K. So what ends up happening here is that uh, I decided to have fun with it and uh, make, try to acquire the world's first 2K by 2K image from the human head. And so, so this was, so the name of the paper is Ultra High Field Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Human Head at a Tesla, 2K by 2K for Y2K. <laughs> the government uh, regulates how much power you can put in a human head uh, because we don't want this to be a microwave. And, and, and of course, that was the risk, right? When I, when I first went into the magnet, people th had told me, well, Pierre, you can have local hotspots and you can fry your brain, right? Some section of your brain. And so that was the risk. So somebody had to be first and uh, I did that. And uh, I can say that yes, in, a, in some way I did put, lay down my life for science. <laughs> okay, and then this is another uh, 2K by 2K. The bottom that you see here is susceptibility and that's known to happen at ultra high field but the images were just phenomenal. There, there was uh, a little membrane here. It, it had never been seen before. And, and these, these striations, that had never been seen before. So the radiologists were just like, oh my gosh, this, we're gonna have to relearn some anatomy here. So, and it, it, was, it was really an amazing time to gather these images. And like I said, I still think they hold the world record for resolution. So, so I was talking about noise, and I, noise power and magnetic resonance must be of thermal origin. As such, noise power depends both on the phase and the composition of the sample of interest. The equation for Johnson noise is applicable only to a graphite sample. Its extension to all of NMR is a gross oversimplification of the problem. And uh, then the next thing related to his question was RF power requirements. So prior, prior to the 8 Tesla being assembled, the MRI community believed that RF power requirements to obtain an image would increase with the square of the angular frequency involved. So you could see here in, in this equation, this is the omega squared term, okay? So the angular frequency was directly related to the magnetic field, so it was increasing with the square of the field. And this actually had been observed, there's a paper uh, by Wen et al. Uh, it's one of Dr. Balaban's papers, and you saw the power clearly did move with the square of the field. And so that was the problem, right? Now you're going to build an eight Tesla magnet, and people that are at four Tesla are saying, well, wait, we're already at the SAR limits, and you're definitely going to be above them because uh, eight squared is, 50, is 64, and four squared is only 16. So, MRI scientists had built into their theory the equivalent of the ultraviolet catastrophe. So for people who know physics, they know what this means. Uh, this is again related to thermal radiation and black body radiation. And uh, the ultraviolet catastrophe, of course, uh, doesn't exist in, in, in the IR. But we had it here in, in MRI theory. So eventually I, I gave some numbers and uh, I don't have to read this whole thing, but at 4.7 Tesla uh, for a sync pulse that was four milliseconds from minus two pi to two pi, I used 330 watts. Uh, and at eight Tesla for the same pulse, it was 100 watts. And uh, this was published in a book by, uh, where Dr. Schriffer was a Nobel Prize winner. He, he won uh, the Nobel Prize for superconductivity and I was invited to this meeting. And, that's where you'll find that report. So, they are, so our RF power requirements were much more complex than initially expected. It wasn't moving with the square of the field. And as a result, people had expected that 
you know, when we do MRI, if you've ever had an MRI exam, you know that sometimes the magnet sounds differently, like you're, you're in there and you're hearing this noise and then all of a sudden the noise changes or, okay? And that's because we're applying different pulse sequences. There's different ways that we can acquire the spins. And this is very complicated, all the different ways. Some, some methods of acquiring the spins don't require a lot of power, like a gradient echo, a uh, flash sequence where it's just a low nutation angle. And some, of, some sequence require tremendous power. So people had said that some sequences would never be done at 8T and uh, that it would be impossible to achieve. And one of those sequences was M-depth. And uh, I was privileged enough to have uh, Dave Norris. He was trained at Cambridge, and uh, he came to Ohio State and collected for us uh, these M-depth images at 8Tesla. And M-depth, everybody had said, you'll never get an M-depth image at 8T, and there they were. And that was published in 1999. And uh, here are some other M-depth images done by David. And the other technique that required a lot of power is the rare sequence. And uh, here are some rare images also done with David and my group. I was massively ill that week. I, was, I, was, I can confess that I was almost not at work when this was done. I was, I was home extremely, extremely ill. And, uh, but people kept working and telling me, okay, Pierre, we got that one, we got that one. And uh, so for me, uh, I mean, it was very gratifying to see the images and... Uh, I'm still grateful to David today for, for investing and coming uh, to uh, Columbus to, to see these, to, to do these sequences. And we had other uh, people in magnetic resonance. Uh, Paul Matthews, who today is Sir Paul Matthews, uh, stayed at my home, and uh, he's one of the giants in magnetic resonance as well. So AT got me to meet many, many people. I also got to meet John Glenn. That's the best person. Uh, so I got, I got invited to go meet John Glenn in his office and have a private conversation with him and Annie Glenn for half an hour. I was the only one in the room. And I, I'll never forget it because it was such a privilege to get to meet John Glenn. So, and the other thing I got was uh, I got invited to the national prayer breakfast where we pray for the president. And that was the year that President Clinton was president of the United States, and it was also the year that he was facing impeachment. And uh, it, it was a very sad moment for American history, and uh, at that prayer breakfast, the uh, Yitzhak Rabin's wife was speaking, and the other speaker was y Yasser Arafat, which of course Rabin and Arafat were enemies. So that was uh, kind of sharing quite a bit of... Uh, history here that I was blessed to do, uh, to share uh, because of my wor work in science. So again, RF power requirements were much more complex than initially ex expected. And after the AT came along, you'll see that all these papers are post-1998, then people started arguing, well, the power can come down and, you know, and that there's all kinds of different uh, evaluations of, of power in magnetic resonance, but one thing is clear is it never moved with the square of the field. So uh, I just said the first sentence. Many want, now this is something important, many want to treat power deposition in MRI solely on the basis of electromagnetic field theory. This has many advantages as the results obtained can be computed uh, with modern FDTD methods. However, this also provides a false sense of understanding as heat exchange is fundamentally a quantum mechanical process, as you're looking at a thermal process, the mechanisms involved in eventually accounting for the thermal emission of a photon from a piece of graphite must also account for its absorption. So however you emit a photon from graphite, that you have to use the same mechanism to absorb the photon. And so this is uh, what drives people really crazy about me, because I came to this, I. I I wrote this sentence once, and that was that assuming that MRI is a thermal process, assuming that a thermal process is involved, application of Wien's displacement law would yield, yield an apparent temperature of less than one Kelvin for the human head. Of course, my head's not at one Kelvin. This result is incongruent with actual temperature measurements and would most likely occur due to the inappropriate application of Wien's law to samples that are primarily or strictly liquids. So what, the, what I'm saying here is 
if you're going to get a temperature uh, using thermal methods, you have to make sure that you follow the laws of emission. And one of the laws is that you have to be in thermal equilibrium with a perfectly opaque enclosure. So remember that the Big Bang, it was never in thermal equilibrium with a perfectly opaque enclosure. And neither are the oceans. So when you have uh, things that can have convection currents or unusual bonding, you can get the wrong answer. And that's what, uh, it was this idea which people still, I, I'm sure that when MRI people look at this uh, presentation, they'll be furious that Pierre is still talking about this. And uh, but that's okay. What, what we're saying is, if you make an error, you get a lousy answer. So you're not allowed to, to take that temperature, and that's why you get the wrong temperature. And so if you want to get a proper temperature, you have to know that the source is following the conditions that it must, and for Penzias and Wilson, their source never did. So I wrote, <laughs> this also drove people crazy. In, uh, and I won't tell you the, the whole story, except to tell you that one of the top physicists in the country encouraged me to go ahead and send this abstract to the American Physical Society in 1999. And it, the abstract title was Nuclear Magnetic Resonance and the Age of the Universe. And uh, just to tell you, I, I was not well that year, and I actually, this is the one abstract that I never presented. I never withdrew it, but I also was too ill to go present it. So it was never presented, but it is in the abstract book, non-withdrawn. So MRI is a thermal process. Uh, I wrote this uh, in 1999. I believe that the, NM the entire NMR experiment should be viewed as a quantum mechanical process and that quantum phenomena should be invoked both in dealing with the spins and in addressing issues such as the exchange of heat and RF power. First and foremost, Planck's work deals with the quantized nature of heat exchange. When we are pulsing into our samples, we are also involved in the exchange of heat. Now. Here's an interesting problem. Let's say that you wanted to do the reverse of what Planck did. So, you know, these black bodies, they're emitting photons. And let's say that you wanted to do the absorption problem. Well, how would you do it? I mean, if you took a laser and you blasted a cube, well, you would melt it, right? You don't know when to stop. But this is something unique about MRI. With MRI, NMR, and EPR, that's electron paramagnetic resonance, the spins provide an indirect monitoring of the lattice. If you give a 90 degree pulse, most of the energy enters a lattice and very little in the spin system. So by ramping an MRI magnet from low to high fields, one could monitor the density of states in the sample by always giving a 90 degree pulse at each frequency. Of course, you have to account for quality factors in the coil, etc. And you could use a completely enclosed RF coil, one could eliminate losses to space. In this way, one could examine the absorption problem in a manner which is complementary to the emission problem in black body radiation. So there's a, I actually believe in abstracts, so I sent a little abstract to the American Physical Society and it describes that experiment, the reverse of the Planckian experiment that was in 2004 in Montreal. So a proper understanding of black body radiation is important as it touches virtually all the physics from the study of condensed matter to the understanding of noise, power, and spin relaxation in MRI, and it's also fundamental to astronomy. So in conclusion on the MRI part, NMR is an extremely powerful methods to, method to study heat transfer since our spins are reporting the status of the, lat of the lattice. As such, with the use of rampable magnet, we, magnets, we are in a unique position to study the density of states problem in the, in the lattice. And by accepting the classical treatment, we, igno we are ignoring details which are rich and promising for future generations of NMR scientists. So the key findings uh, at a Tesla at OSU, the first, of course, we had great signal to noise. Second was the RF penetration problems do not exist in the human head in ultra-high field MRI, contrary to what had been believed. Such issues can be solved with RF coil designs and acquisition methods. Second, dielectric resonances do not exist in UHF MRI. Uh, I have a spelling mistake there. 
Homogeneity problems are related to coil and sample interaction and constructive and destructive interference problems. These can largely be overcome with modified hardware and acquisition methods. Third, and this is important, RF power requirements do not continue to increase with the square of the frequency as had been predicted prior to the acquisition of the first MR UHF MRI images. And this is important to this community. RF coils and MRI are resonant and not black. Kirchhoff's law cannot be valid for otherwise clinical MRI would not exist. So, so now we, we're going to go to part two now and it's just, uh, I don't know how I'm doing. Guy's still awake. It goes faster now. That was the, that was. <laughs> <laughs> so Kirchhoff's claim, uh, you can always read this online. We're not going to read it. But he basically said, if you have a cavity and you're in thermal equilibrium with that cavity and the cavity is opaque, the radiation will always be the same inside that cavity, depending only on the temperature and the frequency and independent of the nature of the walls. The ratio between emissive power and absorption power is the same for all bodies at all at the same uh, frequency, at the same temperature. And then Kirchhoff, so you have emission over uh, absorption equals some function E. The function E was given to us by Planck. So the left side is Kirchhoff, the right side will be Planck. But, but Kirchhoff, so what is the difference now? People sometimes don't understand when I'm talking about this. They think that I'm attacking Planck. Well, no, Planck's solution is valid for actual black bodies, okay? It's Kirchhoff that has a problem. He's saying all cavities are black, and I'm saying no, not all cavities are black. That's not right, okay? So Kirchhoff immediately sets the absorption to one. So this is an idealized state. And, and I understand, it, as anybody who's taken a modern physics course, that this is, Kirchhoff imagines something that's a perfect emitter and he sets absorption to one. But if I set it to zero in the perfect reflector, as we hope to have when we do MRI, then that function blows up. So perfect reflectors uh, definitely cannot uh, support Kirchhoff's claim. And remember, he said it was independent of the nature of the walls. So Kirchhoff's paper was uh, theoretical in nature and it contained no experimental proof. And I won't dwell too much on this because I have lectures on it. So, do all, so the, does experimental proof exist? Do arbitrary ca cavities always, in thermal equilibrium always contain black radiation? So the first thing you should observe is that laboratory uh, black bodies are always made from good absorbers of, radi of radiation. They're never made from poor emitters. So that right there tells you Kirchhoff is wrong. If he was right, NIST shouldn't be spending millions of dollars on building us black bodies and specialized device. Remember that Planck's work, he depended on the work of Rubens and others to make black body cavities for him and get his black body emission curve. If Kirchhoff was right, why did we need specialized laboratories to do that? Any cavity should have worked provided it was opaque, but obviously that wasn't true. So they themselves knew it wasn't true, but they still kept adhering to Kirchhoff's law. So graphite and soot continue to play an important role in the construction of black bodies, and you could read about this. There's citations in my papers. But this is the key thing, and this is what has been missed by physics, is that real black bodies can do work, and perfect reflectors cannot. So we depend in MRI on having a perfect reflector. We don't want it to do work. We don't want our coil to do work on our radiation. We just want it to transmit it, right? And, and that's the same thing for lasers. In lasers, you have mirrors, and these mirrors are, are building up waves between the, the mirrors, and they have quality factors of 10 to the 11th. Now, to tell you what that is, a quality factor of 10 to the 11th, that means it'll hold for every 10 to the 11th wave it's standing, it'll lose one. Well, that's perfectly reflecting. Right? 10 to the 11th, no black body has ever approached these kinds of numbers. So perfect reflectors exist, and they're telling us that Kirchhoff cannot be right. And this is uh, an experiment where I was trying to demonstrate to people that perfect reflectors don't do work, and that graphite as a perfect absorber does. So I took this little block of uh, graphite and then steel, brass, copper, and aluminum, and I challenged it. Oh, first, if you look at it at room temperature, just don't do anything to it. All the cavities look the same. 
So that makes you think, wow, Kirchhoff's got to be right. All the cavities are looking the same. But that's because they're getting filled by... So there are two things happening. In graphite, it can produce that radiation. That, it's at the temperature of the room, so it can produce what is the white dot there. But for the perfect reflectors, they never produced that white dot. It came from the room and then just filled the cavity. There's a difference. So, so then what I did was I challenged the cavities and this is just a brief challenge. Now, this is not really going to change the temperature of, of these cavities. They're going to be still very close to thermal equilibrium. But look what happens. The graphite is immediately able to do work. It takes the incoming radiation and it keeps its hole black. It reports what the hole would look like uh, uh, just based on the temperature of the graphite block. Okay, so the hole is black. But the other ones, the, the three on the left, uh, they're, they're very close to perfect reflectors. So what are they giving us? They're giving us the radiation from the rod, except the, the steel here is acting closely like, a, like a, uh, a good black body. And you could read about this little experiment in this paper. So what happens is that graphite converts the incoming radiation immediately to radiation corresponding to the temperature of the walls. When challenged, the holes which are constructed from nearly perfect reflectors are unable to convert the incident radiation to radiation which would have corresponded to the temperature of their walls. It's not a thermal equilibrium question, as their temperature remains essentially unaffected by the rod. It's a question of ability to do work. And if you take a course in modern physics, this is never taught. When we talk about black bodies, they never talk about the work aspect, that a black body has to do work. So, uh, so real black bodies can do work, perfect reflectors cannot. And here's an example where I take this block and I put it on a hot plate. The bottom four are copper, then graphite. I think the next one is aluminum and then brass. And you can look in the paper for the, for the assignments. But look at the graphite holes. They're all white. Now, they have different depth. The holes on the right the four holes on the right, three are black and one is white, the one in graphite is white. Those holes are just the tip of the drill bit into the block. That's all that there is there, okay? And then as you go down, I think the next hole might be a quarter inch, half inch, and an inch, okay? So as you go down the hole, as you go to the left, the holes get deeper. But what are you seeing here? On the, all this block is sitting at the same temperature. It's been sitting on a hot plate for hours. Okay, so it's, it's all come to thermal equilibrium. It's at one temperature. Now that, Kirchhoff had said that all the holes should look the same, but they're not looking the same, right? The little graphite hole on the right is already white, but the three from the perfect reflectors are not. Why? Because they're manifesting what radiation is in the room, not in the hot plate. Right? It's what's in the room that's penetrating these things, and they're not able, they can't do work, so they can't produce the white radiation that the graphite hole did. Okay? So the graphite is white because it did work, and the other three could not do work, and that's why they remain black. And then the, as you go over to the left, you see that now it's a mixture of radiation coming in from the hot plate that's captured in the, in the hole and then radiation from the room. So that's why you, know, you now see these crescent shapes inside of this. There's two types of radiation in here. One corresponding to the temperature of the room and the other one corresponding to the temperature of the hot plate. So again, this proves that Kirchhoff cannot be right. And the, and the reason is, is that the, the, the perfect reflectors are unable to do work they'll sustain whatever radiation is given to them. It has nothing to do with thermal equilibrium. So, this uh, only graphite was able to do work and perfectly reflecting cavities will display incident radiation. So, this is something, if, if, you could only, if I could only convey this message to the world, this would be it. That because of Kirchhoff's law, Planck's equation remains unlinked to the physical world. And I have a little video on SkyScholar on this. And this is, a, this is a central thing here. That Planck, Planck wrote an equation. So we had, this, we had this light, and Planck gave us the equation for it. Okay, But he never told us what caused the photons. Uh, what were the physical, uh, what was the physical setting? What were the energy levels? What were the transition species? But in every other spectroscopic method, and I'm a spectroscopist by training, we can always identify these first three. But because of Kirchhoff, 
and it's independent of the nature of the walls, Planck's equation was never linked to the physical world. Now, the reason that's important to you is it enables solar physicists to say that we can produce a black body spectrum from anything, or it enables the big bangers to tell us that they can get a black body radiation from the creation of the universe. They can't. Once you link these things, once you explain why do you get a thermal photon from, from graphite, whatever mechanism you use, everyone will be bound by it. So all of this theory will collapse. So this is actually a terrible blow to astronomy here. So surely the situation can be corrected if true black body emission is viewed as a consequence of vibrating atomic nuclei within the confines of a lattice structure. Now, you met Tony Parat yesterday, and Tony invited me uh, to, to send him a paper, <laughs> actually two. <laughs> The first one was rejected, it was on the sun, and, uh, which is okay. The second one was on Kirchhoff's Law, and that did get published. And Tony did confess to me, he told me, Pierre, I've been reading all your papers. So we've known each other a while, and uh, it's thanks to Tony Perrot that this paper on Kirchhoff's Law was published. Uh, and then I've, I'm giving a talk on Kirchhoff's Law in Germany next month. Uh, I submitted the talk and then that had to be reviewed by the German Physical Society and it was accepted. So this is a half hour talk on the history of Kirchhoff's Law of Thermal Emission. Now a lot of people say, well nobody's paying attention to Robitaille. <laughs> Actually, scientists are quiet people. Most of, most of them are just reading and they're quiet and uh, they don't do YouTube videos, I know that. And, and uh, they just think quietly and, and they will slowly come to a conclusion, okay? They're not jumping up and down and so on. So most people will just listen and think. It, it, just because you don't see something in the media doesn't mean that the things are, there's no undercurrent in science that things are changing. And a positive thing for me was that uh, a group of Czech physicists, uh, including uh, the head of physics at Prague, uh, wrote a paper uh, just this last year where they finally said that Kirchhoff's law was an illusion and they cite my paper with Steve. So we're, we're, we're on our way now. Now the other thing is that uh, I get the same flag for the liquid metallic hydrogen model of the stars and uh, two, uh, two uh, scientists, two physicists from the Netherlands have now written a paper that the standard model of the sun is about to be replaced by the liquid metallic hydrogen model. That's, it might soon be replaced by that model. So people out there know and they're thinking. They just, it's a big blow and, and we don't want revolution. Let's have a quiet transition. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm talking about the sun and I'm going to start again with this block because that's what it's all about, boys and girls. <laughs> it's about this block. So, in order to understand the thermal spectrum of the sun and the stars, one must look at graphite and soot, because that's how we get a thermal spectrum on Earth. These are the best materials that we had to build early black bodies, and the uh, National Institutes of uh, Standard and Technology is still using graphite in their black bodies. So, a a gaseous plasma, like a gaseous plasma sun, even through the sum of many processes, is unable to produce a black body spectrum. If you look at the bottom paper there, stellar opacity, the Achilles heel of the gaseous sun, that is very clearly explained. You cannot produce a black body spectrum by taking the sum of processes that have nothing to do with black body radiation. All that is required is the presence of heat and a hexagonal lattice with delocalized electrons. The emission of a thermal photon from graphite is not an electrical process, okay? Similarly, the generation of the solar spectrum is not the result of an electrical process. The production of a solar spectrum is not an arc discharge process, okay? It has whatever happens in graphite has to happen on the sun, and that's why I'm telling you, and I have been saying to people, the sun has a real lattice. It's the only way it can get that spectrum. So you cannot invent, you cannot say, well, graphite does it this way, but now for the sun, I'm going to do it another way. Well, then you're not doing physics anymore. Whatever we discover in the laboratory, that's how we have to do it. 
And uh, I won't talk long about the stars. This is my only slide. So see, we're going through the stars very fast. We just finished the sun. And, and the reason is, my central thing that I want to talk about the sun, well, I mentioned yesterday, that first, it has a surface. The second thing is that it must have a vibrational lattice. It has to have a lattice or else it can't produce that spectrum. So that's the take home message and there's much more that you can learn about thermal emission on Sky Scholar. Now, if you look at the HR diagram, if you're a conventional uh, physicist, you'll say, well, the stars, are, of course, they're distributed this way in the HR diagram. This, and uh, we have, of course, the main sequence that you're familiar with in the HR diagram. And, and the uh, astrophysics is telling us, well, if it's a star on the main sequence, it's, it's, they're always burning hydrogen, okay? But thermal emission has nothing to do with nuclear reactions. It's, it's, it has to do with lattice. So if you're on the main sequence, what I'm saying is that uh, it, the thermal emission depends on temperature and lattice structure. So the position of the star on the HR diagram is determined by its temperature and lattice. It has nothing to do with the nuclear fuel being burnt. So current schemes of stellar evolution based on changes in nuclear fuel are a product of assuming that all the stars are made of gaseous plasma. They are not. They are comprised of condensed matter and all the stars can make all the elements. We must not cripple the sun and the stars using theory. So you know, because right now they're telling us the, star, the sun can only make helium. Well, that's just... So now we have, to make, we have to make the elements in first generation stars, which blew up, and then we have to use the Big Bang, and it's just too much. I mean, if, if we can make the elements here on Earth, then we can't say that the sun can't. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm saying that this has to be lattice structure, which determines, if you're on the main sequence, you have the same type of lattice on your photosphere as the sun. And then uh, the white, the, the wolf Rayet stars in the upper left here, they're actually not here in the upper left because the wolf Rayet stars don't give you a thermal spectrum, right? They're in, emi they're in emission. And what I'm saying is that the wolf Rayet stars are so hot that they're unable to create an organized lattice, so therefore they can't give you an emission spectrum. That's why they, we, we, we put them in the upper left, but, but technically they don't have a lattice. So... Now, how about the luminous blue variables right next to them? So what I'm saying is that the luminous blue variables are formed because now you have a hot star that's starting to cool and you're starting to make a lattice. And when you do, you're making a hydrogen lattice and that will force other types of, of uh, atoms out. So that's why these are violent stars. Uh, they eject material, they change their luminosity because they're in the, mi they're in the midst of forming an organized lattice. So that's why they're so violent. Now how about the white dwarfs down here? So the astronomers tell us that the white dwarfs exist. They put them down here. They have very low luminosity. And they say, well, these are extremely dense stars. No, they're not. I'm saying that they're not dense at all. They, they just have a different lattice. So if you look at your wife's wedding ring or your husband's, your husband doesn't have a wedding ring with a diamond. I hope not. <laughs> so, anyhow, if you look at your wife's wedding ring, you'll see that it's, gra it's carbon and it's transparent, right? And it has about the same density as graphite, but you won't give your wife a piece of graphite for your wedding. <laughs> so, what I'm trying to say is that these are two very different materials, but they're both made from carbon. They have very different emissivities. One is transparent and one's a perfect absorber. So, but they have the same, almost the same densities. So that's what's happening in the white dwarfs. They just have a different lattice, and that lattice is unable to give us a lot of light. So that's why their luminosity is low. Whereas in the gas model, the only way they can explain these stars is to collapse them and make them very small. They're, the only thing they can play with is the radius of the star, because they know the temperature and it moves as R squared. So what they do is they, they collapse the radius, and now they've, they've increased the density. So I'm saying, no, don't touch the density. It's a lattice problem. Now, people will say, well, wait a minute. We've seen redshifts in the, blue in the white dwarfs. So clearly, they're redshifted, so we know that they're very dense. But the problem is, is, if you look at the literature, they also see some blue shifts in dwarfs. But, oh, now we don't want the blue shifts because obviously we have to have high gravity because they have to be gravitationally shifted. 
So what do they do with the blue schist? They say, well, that doesn't come from the dwarf itself. It comes from an accretion disk around the dwarf. So we put an accretion disk around the dwarf so we can explain the blue shift, but we'll keep the red shift because that falls with our theory. So what I'm saying, it's a lattice effect. It's lattice that is governing where these stars are falling on the HR diagram, and they, have, they can have different lattice structures. So for the giants and supergiants, uh, what happens is that you the... the I've talked about intercalate zones, and, and what happens is you have, you have hexagonal sheets of hydrogen, and then between those sheets, you can, you can put non-hydrogen atoms that exist in the solid phase, and when they change rapidly to gas phase, the star expands. So this can explain both the novas and the giants. So if you take a piece of graphite in a, in a graphite filter, you know, like we use these on construction sites or in laboratories. So you take a piece of graphite, a pure piece of graphite, and you can saturate it with atoms. And uh, it won't change at all. It'll look, it won't change, but you've got it saturated. Now all of a sudden, hit the table and the thing will expand a hundredfold. And that's because the, the atoms that came into the graphite that were non-carbon atoms uh, entered intercalate zones. They stayed in the solid phase, and all of a sudden, when they change the gas phase, the graphite expands. So simple processes, and uh, again, I say uh, the stars can make all the elements. I mean, we're, I'm, I think it's too much to try to say that we're going to limit one star, and then they change their, their synthesis and all that. This is. Okay, so the last thing is about the temperature of the universe, the Big Bang, and Haruni's antenna. We're almost done. Look at that. We're getting, we're getting through this thing. So, uh, so people, you know, they, they really, it's interesting when you hear people's comments on YouTube videos. I do look at the comments even though I'm, I'm prevented from commenting by my son. My son won't allow me to comment, but, But I do look at the comments, and it's interesting what you, what, not all the time, but I've, I've looked at enough of them. And uh, on the temperature of the universe problem, it's interesting that people will, will make comments, well, Robitaille doesn't understand. It's not just the temperature of the microwave radiation, it's the red shifts of the stars and the, and the helium abundances in the universe. Well, I've written a paper on the helium abundances in the universe, and you could read that paper to see what I think about measurements of helium abundances in the universe. And the, for people who know Halt and Arp, uh, you know that uh, th there's problems in red shifts. And uh, so, so I'm very aware of the three pillar uh, idea for the Big Bang. But people have to realize that uh, the Big Bang gained in no notoriety after the Penzias and Wilson uh, measurement came. And some people got upset with me, and so there were two theories, steady state and, and the Big Bang, and the steady state died because they couldn't explain uh, the Penzias and Wilson signal. And uh, so when you, when you look at this, uh, if, you, if they lose the Penzias and Wilson signal, it, it, it's over. <laughs> and uh, there's more problems in this than uh, what most people imagine. And... Uh, I think part of it, science is also responsible for it. Physicists uh, are all busy doing their own laboratory work, and uh, they let the cosmologists do their work. They're busy with their own work. And uh, in humanity, you know, you have a responsibility. Uh, if, you, if you find that there's potentially something wrong, you, you have to go for it, after it. And uh, for me, I gave up MRI, and... Uh, that's a complex story, and we won't go there. Uh, but one of the things that I realized is that these were very important problems for humanity, and that's why I went down this path. So uh, this is the Penzias and Wilson antenna, the horn antenna at Crawford Hill Laboratory that the measurement was done on. And uh, we won't read this whole thing, but basically it says we, we got a 3.5 Kelvin signal and we couldn't uh, explain it. And uh, nowhere in the Penzias and Wilson uh, papers do we talk about diffraction of signal into the horn. Now, there's, there's another thing I want to talk about here. When I, I, I gave a talk, I just released a video on the Haruni antenna, 
And, and I highlighted in there that the Penzias and Wilson paper was followed the Dyke paper. And people are saying, well, why, why is that so bad? Well, you'd think it's not a big deal, but it actually is a big deal because the Penzias and Wilson paper should have just gone to a general physics journal. It was already in an astronomy journal. See, they already adopted the interpretation, but the, the three Kelvin signal actually belongs to the Earth, I'm saying. And so maybe if it would have gone to a general physics journal, maybe some geophysicists would have seen it, and they said, well, maybe there's something going on here. We've got a lot of problems with water. Maybe, uh, so maybe there's some other explanations. So I have a problem with already interpreting a signal uh, you know, just publish it first, let people think about it for a bit, and then, uh, then write your theoretical papers. And people say, well, yeah, but that signal had been predicted. Well, you know, people had made all kinds of predictions, 50 Kelvin, 10 Kelvin, there were, there were lots of predictions. So uh, to say that that was predicted <laughs> is just a little too much. So, so nowhere in the Penzias and Wilson papers of 1965 can one find any discussion of the diffraction of nearby signals into their horn. So they don't talk about diffraction, they don't talk about water and where it, might, where it might be expected to emit. Now people wonder, well, how did an NMR guy get into this mess, right? And here's the answer. <laughs> so Ed Purcell is the discoverer of the 21 centimeter hydrogen line in the galaxy. He discovered it one year before, before he won the Nobel Prize in 1952 for NMR. So we're both dealing with radio techniques. Uh, they're doing spectroscopy, so am I. It's basically our samples are different. And this is a picture of Ed Purcell's horn that he used to detect the 21 centimeter line. So these fields are actually much closer than people would imagine. So to tell an MRI person that he cannot look at astronomy is just a little too far reaching considering that Ed Purcell was one of the first radio astronomers. Uh, here's a radio telescope. Uh, from the University of Illinois. It's an old photograph, and you'll notice that the detector here, you have a, a dish, it's a, it's a big dish. Apparently this was on, on asphalt. They made an asphalt base, and then they, they put a screen over it uh, to make this uh, dish, and the detector is sitting on top of these towers and could be rotated. Well, that's kind of exposed to everything, right, that uh, could be uh, coming in from the side. Here's the scoop antenna at Green Bank, which was used to monitor atmospheric changes. Well, that's pretty much the Penzias and Wilson antenna, pretty much the same kind of design. There's nothing sophisticated here. And here's the world's first parabolic reflecting telescope by Grote Reber. And uh, Steve Crothers uh, is the one who told me about this uh, uh, this guy, because apparently he moved to Tasmania, where Steve lives, and that's why uh, Steve knew, knew about him so well. He's kind of honored down there. But uh, here's a picture of his telescope, and, uh, and the detector, of course, is open to everything, right? It's not, it's not hidden from anything. Anything can come in and, and hit this detector from the side. And if you look at modern radio telescopes, I mean, now we're going to talk about Haruni's antenna. And if you look at modern radio telescopes, they're pretty much, I think, all parabolic dishes for the most part, large, large part of parabolic dishes with the detector, like uh, you can see the detectors there suspended in the air above the parabolic dish, and the parabolic dish will bring any photons that are coming in parallel will all focus at the point here of, of, the, of the detector. So, uh, the first thing is that I had written in 2003, it's imprudent to speak in terms of black bodies without noting, as Kirchhoff did, the constraint of the enclosure. So the, the astronomers, they, they need an enclosure, and what they try to say is, well, we did have thermal equilibrium at recombination. Well, this is just an invention of mathematics. They don't know that. The, Kirchhoff's law is very, it, his requirement was very severe. You have to have an opaque enclosure. So thermal equilibrium with an opaque enclosure, not just thermal equilibrium. The enclosure must be opaque. Well, that, that never existed in the Big Bang. So you cannot set a temperature. A source which is not at 3 Kelvin can produce such a signal if it sustains, in addition to emission, another means of contending with internal heat, 
namely conduction and convection. Alternatively, a source which is not a 3 Kelvin can produce such a signal if it has structure wherein one bond is much weaker than another. And of course, I've argued that this signal is coming from the Earth. And it, so I especially like this quote by George Smut. So he's testing a radiometer at Berkeley, and this is what he writes, an invisible patch of water vapor drifted overhead. The scanner showed a rise in temperature. Good, this meant the instrument was working because water vapor was a source of stray radiation. I mean, it's just too much. <laughs> and it, here's another one by Mather where he talks about problems near the Atlantic Ocean. Their job was unusually difficult because the Atlantic weather creates patterns in the air which can produce signals quite similar to cosmic fluctuations. It took the English scientists years to eliminate the atmospheric noise. So to learn more about water, because there's a lot of quotes like this, but I knew the lecture would be long. So to learn more about this, you can uh, see my lecture on the structure of water, which I gave at uh, this conference in 2017. And also look at the paper, Kobe, a radiological analysis. I go through this in detail. So COBE, the COBE satellite is completely unshielded from microwave radiation from below, which can easily diffract into the COBE horn, the Firis horn. Significant diffraction problems are very likely to exist for every other instrument on Earth except one. Now, what am I, so the thing about this satellite, Wilkinson himself, so we have another satellite called WMAP, and Wilkinson himself warned <laughs> That, he, that we had not properly eliminated the possibility of diffraction into the furious horn. He's the one that said it. So it didn't, didn't come from me. You could read about that in my papers where I actually cite uh, where, where that was said. So Kobe has not proven that it's measured the temperature of the universe. Uh, the second thing is that at L2, so now we've sent some satellites to L2. We've, we've sent WMAP there and Planck. And a three, so, the, so people say, well, yeah, but we have, uh, we have anisotropy maps at L2. So obviously we have the microwave background. No, you don't. You have a map which actually has no meaning in cosmology. And you could read my paper, WMAP, a radiological analysis, to see all the problems with how they generated those images. So WMAP was a differential instrument. It was unable to measure the monopole, which is that three Kelvin signal that we want. And Planck should have had, the Planck satellite should have had the capability to measure it on the LFI of the Planck, but it failed to report the signal. So now we come to Haruni's antenna. And people have attacked that, hey, this is uh, just an old antenna here. Who cares about a result from uh, an old broken down antenna? Well, when the, re the result from uh, Dr. Haruni was done, it was not a broken down antenna. It was new and he was testing it. And then he found that there was no, no signal from space. So how could that be? So uh, this, is, uh, this is showing inside the antenna on the right here. You see the detector. So this is actually five meters across because this is not a parabolic antenna. It's a hemisphere. So it doesn't focus onto a point. It, it, so the, the signal comes into kind of a bell-shaped uh, detector here, which is deep within the antenna. Okay, so that's very different than the parabolic antennas that you've seen. Okay, so what's important about that is that it. So the first thing is that, of course, he reported that there was no Big Bang. There could not have been a Big Bang because his antenna self noise was uh, was only 2.6 Kelvin. So it has to have some self noise. So where's the signal from the Big Bang? You're missing. He should have had five, uh, six Kelvin or so. So it was a 54 me, uh, meter dish with an aperture of 20, 32 mil, meters. And most radio telescopes have self noises of greater than 35 Kelvin. Now, here's the thing about Haruni's antenna. He called it an edgeless radio telescope. So that's why it's unique, because any signal that comes in on the right, if you, if you look at the signal, is coming in, and it diffracts, and then it's, it's reflected on the dish, and then comes straight back out. So any signal that's approaching from this side, it's edgeless. It's going to prevent diffracted signal from coming and hitting the detector. So note how the detector is, prevent, is protected from most diffracted signals. 
Now, some people really like Wikipedia, <laughs> so I usually don't use it, but I, I couldn't resist this one. Because this is, uh, on Wikipedia, you'll find an entry of all radio telescopes in the world. And this is what they say about Haruni's antenna, one of the most sensitive and low noise antennas in the world. Okay, so it's got low noise. It only got 2.6 Kelvin at eight millimeters. But some people said, well, the reason it's so low is because it's damping. It's, it's just a terrible antenna. But no, the line is one of the most sensitive. So it's also sensitive and they've done radio astronomy with it. So this is a, actually a very interesting antenna. And you can see that when you move the detector to the side, the antenna self noise rises to 7.4, which has, should be as expected as diffracted signals come in and now hit the detector. So this is a picture of Steve, which maybe some of you know from uh, the EU or have watched his videos. And uh, he's sitting in front of the Parkes Radio Telescope. And there's a, a fun story about the Parkes Radio Telescope. And you almost have to feel sorry for these guys because they, for years, they reported paratons. And they were coming from the galaxy. And uh, they, they published these papers in science and great journals. And it turns out that it was their microwave ovens that in the visitor center, people would open. <laughs> okay, so, so what I'm trying to say here is that's the danger of diffraction, right? So remember when I was talking about MRI and I talked about our magnet room? It was completely shielded and we, we had welded the seams so that no noise can come in. Well, this is like completely open to noise, right? Things can just come in from any side, okay? And not just from the visitor center, for those who do... Uh, I met a guy who did ham radio today, he's, a, an, he's got an extra license, and we know that ham signals can travel almost through tunnels, you know, in the atmosphere, and you'll have very good transmission all of a sudden, it just like a window opens up, and now you'll get a, a signal that comes from someplace on Earth, and just for a brief moment, paf, it goes and hits somewhere else. So maybe other uh, microwaves from much farther away are coming and giving some of their paratons. So, and again, if you look at a modern radio telescope, they're above ground, they do nothing to prevent diffraction, and their detector is wide open. Uh, and again, to remember the magnetic and RF shield around the AT. So, uh, I talked to Arabic, which is the scientist who's trying to save this antenna, and I could tell you that it, it, she had such a hard time uh, when, you know, Armenia had a terrible earthquake in 1988, and uh, I think 25,000 people died. Or it was a large number of people. And uh, it's a poor country. I, b I believe that it's not a rich country. Uh, apparently, there's 8 million people that are Armenians that live outside of Armenia. It's, it's almost like a little Ireland, you know. All the Irish are in the United States. So <laughs> in Armenia, there's only 3 million Armenians that live there. And uh, they have this antenna, and, and why did they get it? It was because Haruni was, uh, he was a, a major force in Soviet uh, radio engineering, and uh, he, I, I, apparently, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I, I believe he's the one that dil built the radio antennas for the, the radar systems for the uh, MiG fighters and so on. So uh, it's interesting to hear... Uh, Dr. Parat talk about the conspiracy as we met with these scientists and we're exchanging things. And so, you know, maybe the Soviets can be our friends too. And uh, it's a sad thing about the world. But anyhow, so Dr. Haruni was, uh, he, he was a very, very famous antenna designer. He wasn't just a nobody. And he was Armenian. And when he got this antenna, this antenna should have gone into Russia or or Ukraine, where everything important ever went in the Soviet Union. But he managed to get the Central Committee of the Soviet Union to place this thing in Armenia. And uh, that's a testament to him. So when he reported an absence of the Big Bang uh, and that his signal was way too low on his antenna, we need to take it very, very seriously. Um, so what's going on with this right now? The Armenian government, so Arevik, who's in charge of this, uh, has uh, been fighting for months uh, to try to get the Armenian government to establish the Haruni United Space Center. And apparently now uh, that's going to go forward. And, uh, of course, m money will, 
she'll she'll have some problems, I'm sure, raising money. But uh, the, uh, she told me today that uh, the Radio Astronomical Society is interested in this antenna and wants to put it as part of their network if we if people can get it back online. So. So I say that the Big Bang doesn't exist for three reasons. First, the Hironi's radio telescope demonstrate that the Penzias and, sig and Wilson signal did not arise from the universe, as the sky had zero Kelvin contribution at eight millimeters at 37.4 gigahertz. And when you consider how that antenna is made, that it's taking care of diffraction, that it hid its detector deep inside the antenna, uh, this is something that you could believe this number. Whereas if you look at the Penzias and Wilson antenna, you know that that's like the scoop antenna, the ice scoop antenna, uh, and, and things could easily diffract into it. it. The other reason that there's no way that, the, uh, that that signal ever came from the Big Bang is that it takes a physical lattice to produce a, a thermal spectrum. And that's what I argue about with Kirchhoff's law. Uh, the Big Bang had no thermal lattice. It had no equilibrium with a perfectly rigid uh, and uh, opaque enclosure, there's no way that that signal came from the Big Bang. So, and of course, I, I remember uh, reading Halton's book years ago. I sent him an email. I says, when you write your next book, try not to be so hard <laughs> on people. I think uh, this goes back to talking about scientists can become discouraged. And for those who know Halton Arp's story, you could see why maybe he took such a tone in, in seeing red, but uh, he did report in his Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies and in seeing red that red shifts do not simply correlate with recessional velocities. So there's a list of relevant publications. They just put them on the screen, so if you want to see them online, you can go. Uh, I did want to thank, I've, I've had a beautiful career, and I want to thank uh, the Department of Radiology and Ohio State University. Uh, Steve Crothers for the Periton paper. We, we had talked about it many times over the phone and, and uh, he, he sent me the right reference and also the, the Parks uh, radio telescope image. Uh, my son Luke, which I always talk about, I have others, but he's the one that uh, started the, uh, the Sky Scholar channel. And Bernadette Carsonson, uh, I'm actually the godfather to her one of her children and uh, uh, she did the illustrations of Kirchhoff's Law. Thank you very much.